Welcome to the Wilder Minds course, Introducing Font Awesome 5. My name is Sean Wildermuth, and I'll be your instructor. In this course, you'll learn by doing. That means there won't be a lot of slides, but there'll be a lot of live coding. You can follow along by getting the before and after code at this GitHub address. Instead of following along, you might be more comfortable with hands-on labs. They'll be available at the end of the module, but they are not as comprehensive as the videos. They won't cover each and every aspect of Font Awesome 5 that I'm going to cover in the videos, but you will get experience working with the technology. If you have questions about the course, there'll be discussion sections after each part of the course. I'll directly respond to those questions on these discussion forums, and I can't answer questions outside of these forums, so please don't bother tweeting me. Before we get started, I'm going to make some assumptions. I'm going to assume you already have some familiarity with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This course in particular isn't tied to any particular backend. We're going to be working with pure HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and you'll need to apply it to your particular problem space. So what exactly is FontAwesome? It's a library that uses client-side icons, so icons that can be used inside your HTML inside the browser. This includes both UI icons, things like icons for calendars and ad and arrows, as well as vendor icons like Facebook, Twitter, and even Font Awesome's icon. In most cases, it's a simple drop-in to your web application or your HTML. In Font Awesome 5, they're also supporting its use on the desktop. We won't be covering desktop usage of Font Awesome, but you can certainly see how it works on their website. The version we're going to talk about, version 5, comes in two basic styles. There's an SVG JavaScript format, and this just requires dropping of a JavaScript file into your HTML, and this works with most modern browsers. It works by manipulating the DOM, so there is some overhead associated with that, and working with other libraries like jQuery, Angular, etc. might be a little bit more difficult because of this manipulation of the DOM. There's also a CSS web fonts version and that simply uses fonts to show the different icons. It works with more browsers than SVG and JavaScript does. It has a very simple usage model, but is not quite as feature complete as the new SVG JavaScript version. As we walk through the course, I'll talk about what features are working with what version and I'll show you how to use both. So let's start by seeing how we actually get Font Awesome into our project. If you go to fontawesome.com, it's going to take you to this new website. If you've used Font Awesome in earlier versions, they're transitioning over to fontawesome.com for the Font Awesome 5 version. The reason they're doing this is primarily because they have now a new pro license that simply gives you more icons. The number of icons that are available in the version 5 is 929 that are free with the free version, which is what I'm going to be using for the course. But if you need some of these other icons, the other 1300 they have, or the new style of icon they have called Light, you'll want to get a pro license. It's pretty cheap and it's certainly worth supporting this great project. But we'll be using the free version in all these demos. There are two simple ways to get Font Awesome. One is to actually download the package. This is a zip file containing all of Font Awesome, so you'll get the files for both the CSS web font version as well as the JavaScript SVG version. You can also use a CDN to just reference from their website the JavaScript involved. And they do have versions of this for the CSS version. But we're going to be using a different way because a lot of us use client-side dependency management using things like Bower, NPM, or Yarn. I'm going to go ahead and just use NPM. So here in the editor, I have a very simple application. I have this very simple project that just includes an HTML file, a place for JavaScript, images, and CSS. Very little to this actual project. But we are using a package.json that's going to show all the different dependencies. You can see here that I'm already depending on jQuery, Popper, and Bootstrap because I'm using Bootstrap as the basis of this website. Whether you use Bootstrap or not, Fonti Awesome can work with all sorts of sites. It doesn't depend on any of these, in fact. It just allows me to create some structure for this very simple example site that we're going to use as a canvas to create our Font Awesome examples. So with just a terminal open, I'm going to add npm install at Fort Awesome, which is the name of their organization, and then slash font awesome. 
that would install the very basics that I need for Font Awesome. I'm actually just going to get the CSS and web version now because that's where we're going to start using it. We'll switch over to the JavaScript SVG version as we continue on and start to hit the limits of what the web fonts version will do. And that package is called free, as in the free version, and then web fonts. And then we're going to do a dash dash save, and this will add it to our package.json for us. So now that we have this, we can see that it's actually been added here in our project, and it's also been downloaded into this node underscore modules directory. Again, if you're not familiar with NPM, this is the only time we're really going to dive into it at all. So let's not worry about it, and let's go straight to our HTML. In order to use it in our project, we're going to actually want to bring in the CSS for Font Awesome. I usually put this right before my actual site's custom CSS and after other project CSS, just in case. So let's create a link, and this will be to node modules where I'm storing it, and then it'll be to Fort Awesome, which is the directory for the name of the organization. And there's the project we got, Web Fonts. And then in CSS, I'm just going to grab the Font Awesome CSS. We'll see some other CSS here that we'll need later on, but I'll show you as we need them. But this is the main CSS file we're going to need. If we save that file and go back to the browser here, you'll see that really nothing has changed. It has loaded our new CSS file, but we're not using it yet, so nothing is shown on the screen. Let's start using Font Awesome. So now let's see how the CSS web font version works. We're going to start back here in our HTML, and I'm just going to look for the navbar brand. This is where it says Font Awesome up on the top of our design. The simplest way that Font Awesome works is to simply add an icon someplace, someplace that's going to match the sizing of whatever text is near it. And it does that by using an eye tag. Now, eye tag is actually used for italics inside of HTML by default, but Font Awesome has sort of hijacked it as an icon tag. And the way you make an icon is to give it a class. First, it's going to be a three-letter description of what icon you're looking for. If you're coming to Font Awesome 5 from an earlier version, this used to be just FA for Font Awesome, but they've decided to get away from that, and now they're using B for Brands, S for Solid, and R for Regular. Once you have one of these three monikers, and let's start with Brand, we're going to name an icon. Now, where do we get these icons? If we go back to the Font Awesome web page, you'll actually see a tab here for icons. And this will allow you to look through all the icons. The first thing I do in this search is I click free because we're using the free version, and then I can just search for it. In this case, I want to just search for brands because these are all the kinds of icons that exist for different brands. Let's say your site just supports PayPal and Stripe. You can use the icons directly from Font Awesome to show that on the page. Bluetooth. Amazon Pay, if anyone actually uses that, Cuttlefish, etc. So you can see a lot of these. And for me, I just want to include the actual Font Awesome logo. And so there it is. It's actually called Font Awesome. And what you do with this name is back in the code, you just say FA for Font Awesome and then the name. In this case, that's Font Awesome. Now, if this was Twitter, it would be that. If it were Facebook, it would be that. So usually they're a simple name. Sometimes I'll even try to guess, and if I can't find it, then I'll go search for it. But I know that in this case, I actually wanted to show Font Awesome. If we save this and go back, we'll see this weird square where the font should be. And this is an indication that we're actually missing the font that has our icon in it. The reason we're missing it is that inside of our style sheets, we need more than just Font Awesome. This represents the basics of all the Font Awesome CSS that is required, but it also needs, and I'm going to do a little copy-paste here, the different CSS for the different styles. This way you can really decide to only include the CSS you're using. If you're using all regular icons or just some of the brand icons, you can choose which CSS without polluting your giant CSS space with a bunch of tags you're not going to use. So I'll go ahead and include brands there. Go ahead and save it. And we can see our font awesome icon now shows up. If I make it a little bigger, you'll see that it really is sized directly to the text that's beside it. If we come back here, and usually I'll put a space after the icon to give it a little room, let's change this to an H1. 
and you'll see that it's become much larger because we made this a much larger piece. And if we take this down to something like an H4, which obviously would be smaller, it's going to resize itself as well. So the key about creating these icon tags is that you're really creating something that is going to go with whatever text is with it. And we'll see some examples of that. But in this simple way, we can see this actually working. Let's take a look at this ugly copyright symbol, and let's actually use Font Awesome to show that instead. So here, if I go down to my copyright, we'll have the simple ampersand copy directive here that shows the copyright symbol for the font we're using. But let's say I want a little bit more control over that. Then I can just create an icon and say class. And in this case, I'm going to use just the regular icons. There isn't going to be a copyright inside of the brands. The brands are only those brand symbols. Regular is going to be the regular version of the symbols, and Sala is going to be a bit thicker version of them. So let's go find that FA copyright, which I'm hoping is going to be the right name. We can do this by let's get rid of brands, and let's say copyright. And we'll see we have two different versions here. And if we click on one, let's say we like this one better, we'll see that this is actually the regular version. At the bottom of each of these symbols is going to be an example of the exact icon that you want to use. So if we look at this copyright and we got lucky, uh-oh, we got that weird symbol again. And the reason we did, I'm guessing most of you aren't surprised, is that we were missing the regular CSS as well. Now that we come back that the regular has been updated, there we have that copyright symbol. And we can make decisions about how to make it smaller or larger, but for now we can see that's working there. Let's create one more icon just to complete this idea. And we'll do that by going down to the body. And I'm just going to create a button. This button and buzz button success are all part of Bootstrap. I won't discuss what that's about, but this is just creating a lovely button that I might just want to have save. We can see here is a simple save button, but it might be useful to have an icon there just to make it more clear to people. So I'll create an eye tag. In this case, I'll create a solid one for the save button, and I'll actually see if save works. That might be the name of it. To come over here, and we get that ugly icon again, and you really shouldn't be surprised now that we actually need the fourth style sheet. And this is the case where we're using both of the free styles, the regular and the solid. You might decide to make your CSS sheet smaller to go ahead and use regular. And again, I know it's four different CSS at this point to use all the different icons, but you may decide to use some minification, bring them all together, or merge them into a site CSS with only the pieces you're using. There's a lot of options there, but at a minimum, it's allowing you to do the right thing, and that is bring as little of it to the table as you want. We come back here, we can now see a save icon. And it has a little disk that most of you don't know what it is, but we all know that is the icon for save now. So now that we've seen the CSS and web font version, let's see how the SVG and JavaScript version work. So now let me introduce you to how the SVG and JavaScript version work. First thing you'll want to do is just comment out all the CSS because we're going to be using this different version. And what I'd like to be able to do is go ahead and add right here at the bottom the version for, for the SVG JavaScript version. But we don't actually have it installed yet. What we'll need to do is go back down to the console and add this. So first we'll need to just add the raw font awesome package. This is just at Ford Awesome slash Font Awesome. And in that case, we can include in our script here, we could now see there's Font Awesome and there's an index.js. That index.js is a version that works with the browser. The .es and .d are for other purposes, but we can go ahead and use index.js for the version in a browser. If you want a minified version of that, you'll want to go ahead and combine your different JavaScripts together with a minifier. It's not going to do that for you. So if we save this and go ahead and look in the browser, we'll see that all our icons are missing. 
And they're not missing because we have to do something different in the markup. They're actually missing because all we have is the JavaScript on that page to wire it up. But we don't actually have the actual symbols themselves. Just like where we had to include the different CSS files, they actually have broken out the different icon types into their own packages. So here we'll want to say and get the free brands package. the free solid package for the solid icons, and then finally, the regular. Now, if you had the Pro license, you could have also downloaded the light icons as well, as well as having larger versions of those. Now that we have those three included, let's close that, and we're gonna need to add the scripts from each of those as well. And in those cases, it's going to be, let's say, free brands as a start, and then index.js. One thing to note is with this version, with the JavaScript and SVG version, everything's done in JavaScript. There's no CSS required at all. So these are just a different approach to doing it. I'll add the regular, and I'll finally do for the last one, solid. Now that I've included all these, our icons are back. Now what's interesting about what is happening here is that both methods use the exact same markup, no matter what you do. There is some differences when we start to look at some of the more advanced features that only work in the JavaScript version, but most of the markup is exactly the same, especially simple case markup. Now you might be wondering why would I wanna do one versus the other? And it really comes down to browser support and weight. When looking at the Font Awesome documentation, they imply in most cases the SVG should be faster, but it does come with a smaller number of browsers it supports, and frankly, a smaller number of browsers that it works on. And there's a difference between supports and works on. And let me show you what I mean by that. So if we look at the how to use button, we'll see that with SVG, and we'll start there, all the way at the bottom, is gonna be this list of browser support. So notice this is IE 10 and 11, and 11 even might not work because of some of the ways they're doing things. And they're officially supporting on the desktop and on mobile certain versions of Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Now, in most of these, they're saying the last two major versions. Now, this is what they're going to, in fact, support. That doesn't mean that these won't work on some older browsers as well, but you can pretty much guarantee that the JavaScript version we're looking at is not going to work on IE9 if that's important to you and your consumers. If we come back here and look at the web fonts with CSS version instead, and go down to the bottom, We'll see that this support is a bit more expanded, but not a lot. The support Chrome, Safari, and Firefox are the same. And the IE, it's going to support back to version 9. But being able to throw out version 9 allowed the CSS version to support 9 where the JavaScript version wouldn't. Most probably because of the need for SVG. But there's one other thing to be concerned about. And that is, in the case of the CSS version, your markup isn't manipulated at all. It's simply using fonts to display the icons. In the case of SVG, let's go ahead and actually dig into the source. And we'll see that where we used to have this IFIR copyright, we now have this block of SVG. Now that's fine, it works, no problem, we're happy with it. The problem really comes into, what if I'm programming against wanting to change this? Using raw JavaScript to change this just against the DOM isn't that hard if you know that this is gonna happen. But when you start to get into things like jQuery, being able to find the sections that you're actually looking for and having things named, if we had named this I, it wouldn't have magically named it here as well. And if it did name it, changing the style of this becomes a little weird because when we change, let's say, what icon we want to use, which is the most common of the JavaScript needs, it's going to need to replace this again. 
And so the documentation has some workarounds for how to do it with jQuery and some other cases, but it really means you're going to have to dig in a little deeper to manipulate these. And that's the reason I mostly am starting with Font Awesome 5 with the CSS version until I need one of these more advanced features that they've added. They have some really cool features, but are they worth the complexity? And that's the question I'm sort of asking myself right now. And that depends on project to project. If I'm really getting some good use out of it and I can justify the additional work involved if I have to manipulate it, then it becomes important. So that's it with all the sort of discussion about which versions. Let's actually dig into some more of the features, and we'll do that pretty much through the rest of the course. So let's talk about fixed width icons. Common use in building icons is to use them in a similar way to icons for bulleted lists. So if we create a simple unordered list here, let's say I want to have some icons. I just have a list item, save icon, newspaper icon, etc. with my different pieces of text afterwards. I can see them show up here, but they look kind of ugly because they aren't lined up. We can see that it's sort of jagged. And there's a couple of ways to solve this in Font Awesome. The first is to add fontawesome.fixedwidth after each one of these. When we do that, it picks a standard width for icons and in fact centers them in that width. And there they look great. But we can also come here and add a class for FAUL and that will actually remove the bullets themselves so that we can use our icons as the bullets. And that's a pretty common usage case as well. There's ways to remove the icons in different libraries, but this is a way that Font Awesome thought they would throw in support in case you're not using a bootstrap or one of those. Now let's take a look at animated icons. So now let's talk about animated icons. So let's assume we want something above our main section here that's gonna show a loading cursor. We might want something to say something like loading, and that would be fine. I would just get a little alert loading indicator up here. We could turn on or off, but what I'd like to do is actually have an icon here, and I'll go ahead and make it a solid. Let's say we want something like a weight cursor. Let's go ahead and find one. And let's type something like spin. And we could certainly use this spinner, which is a standard one, but I'm gonna use this map marker so we can see what that looks like. Now we can see the icon is showing there. We'd like to be able to have a way to show it actually moving so we can have something that would grab the attention of our users. We can do that by adding FA spin on the end. That will simply spin whatever icon we're dealing with. We can now see that spin. Of course, that's not quite on center because it wasn't necessarily designed for a loading icon. We could certainly do this with any sort of thing we want. So if we do something like a cog, which is an icon I know, looks like a little gear, or we could even use that spinner we saw a second ago and show it. And so you can depend on whatever icons you can find that might make sense for using these. You can use those to very quickly animate and spin them. There's one other kind of animation called pulse. And if we look now, it's a little harder to see, but it's actually only going in the eight cardinal directions. It's not spinning evenly. It's actually going north, northeast, east, southeast, south, etc. And this can be useful, like in the spinner icon, it makes it look actually lovely. Instead of spinning, it actually looks like it's moving in parallel. And you can see this with some others, like if I go to the sync icon, we can see it's moving a little chunkily, and we'll probably want that to be a spin. But those are some built-in animations that are supporting Font Awesome to be used in these pretty simple scenarios. Sure, you might want to get your own loader GIF, or you want, might want to write some code to do something more spectacular. But in many cases, this is all you need to distract the users. Ooh, look, something spinning until you're downloading anyway. So let's talk about sizing of icons next. So now let's see how sizing works in Font Awesome. I'm just going to create a new div down here, and inside I'm just going to create a I'm just going to create a simple map marker icon. We can see that here. Let's go ahead and create a couple of these so we can have it as an example. And if I make this first one, I can actually add a sizing specification that says SM for small. If I can look here, you can see there's a small difference between the two sizes. I'm going to zoom this up a little so we can see it a little better. And let's come down here and say XS for extra small. We'll see an even smaller one. 
and then finally a LG for large. And so making icons are relatively the same size. These allow you to tweak the size of an icon as needed. For example, on these bullets, each of these are a little taller than the text. I would probably have made them small instead of the full size. But there's also support for sizing them more dramatically. And the way this works is to say FA 2X for double size, 3X for triple size, and this goes all the way up to 10X. So all the numbers between 2X and 10X are supported. Come back here now, see two times the size of that, three times the size of that, and of course, 10 times the size of that. And because we're using fonts or SVG to do these, making them bigger is gonna make them be just as smooth as when they were small. Now, I don't know how many people are actually gonna need a 10 size icon, but the support for sizing is there. Now that we've seen it in different sizes, let's talk about transforming the icons. So now let's talk about transforms and icons. I'm going to create another div here. And I'm just going to create an icon for hand paper. This is an icon I know about, and I'm just going to start with it out at 4x so we can see the change a little easier. Back here we can see our huge paper hand icon. And to transform it, there's a few ways to do it. The one that works in CSS as well as SVG is FA rotate, and then you're going to give a degree. And this degree is fixed. There's only 90, 180, and 270 that are supported. These are going to spin them in place. So let's do 90. Now we can see the hand has rotated 90 degrees. And I'll do 270 as well. And so that's going to support simple rotations that you might need. In many cases, the same icon will exist in some of these different transformations. But sometimes, like the paper hand, you don't have hands going in all four directions, so you want to use rotation to do that. You can also use flip. You get a vertical to flip it, and notice that the finger's on the other side, so it actually flipped it vertically. It didn't rotate it 180 degrees. The difference here would be that the finger moves to the other side. So there is a difference between rotating and flipping. Same here for horizontal. If you do it there, we're just flipping it between left hand and right hand. So that can be useful as well. But sometimes these aren't quite enough. And in the JavaScript version, we also can use data annotations. These are ones that Font Awesome has to create more computational-based transforms. And so they all start with data-fa for Font Awesome. And then I'll say transform. And there are a number of transforms. You can read on the website to see all of them, but I'll be showing you a few of them. So rotate 90, instead of using the class, works in exact the way you might imagine. But the difference is this number does not need to be 90, 180, or 270. We can do things like rotate 45 degrees or rotate 25 degrees. Who would ever do 25 degrees? But this allows you to do exact transformations. So also allow you to do things like shrink to make it smaller. Again, this shrink is happening after the 4X was applied here in the class. And so whatever the icon appears like this, these transforms are then added to. So I could also say grow. And so it's making this even bigger in place. And in the same way, we can tell it to go down, let's say 15, and it's going to move down the page. So these are simple transforms for changing the way icons look. Much more advanced usage. You're probably not going to need it all that often, but every once in a while, you'll see it be really useful. We'll actually use it for layering icons, which we'll do next. So now let's see how we can layer icons on top of each other. So let's start again with a brand new div. I'm just going to start with a couple of icons. I'm going to say a light bulb and let's say square. So two pretty simple icons. And here I'm gonna show you that we can use the sizing, say 3X in this case, to apply to an entire container as well. So there's our two icons, which of course aren't gonna work because we have this nasty hand in the way. Let's get rid of this data transform. I'm actually gonna leave it commented out here so that you can have it later, even though we're not using it right now. 
And now we can see we have these two icons and maybe we might want to layer them so that this is inside of a square. The way you do that is you put them in a span together and you add a class to the span called FA Layers. This tells it that inside you want both of these to be in the same place. So we now have a lovely layered icon, but of course this is ugly as sin because these weren't really made to be exactly layered. So what we can do is go ahead and use those transforms. Let's take the light bulb and let's just shrink it by, let's say, three. Not quite enough. Let's go five. Okay, a little parlor game until I get it right. Now we have this combined icon and I'm having them both together. Often this can be used to create circular or square icons where we really just have the simple icons. One of the tricks there is to use the solid version of the square. Where we have the solid version of the square, but of course black on white, white on black isn't going to work. What we could do here is add FA inverse to make it white, but we still can't see it. The reason is that this light bulb is below the square. The square is being drawn on top of it. Come back here, we now have that white icon right on our black square. So we can see by combining a couple of these simple ideas, we can start to put together more creative ways of using these icons. By default, inverse is going to be white and they're going to be black by default. But of course, we could certainly come here and instead of saying inverse, we can add a style or probably your own class to change the color. And let's make this uh, pink. Color meaning just for the icon. And now we have a pink icon on a black square that's under it. This is going to allow us to do a lot with this sort of layering. But sometimes what we want isn't to layer icons on top of each other. So let's look at another example. So we start with a span of FA layers. Let's start with a bookmark. Again, another one that I happen to know because I wrote down notes earlier, so you wouldn't be surprised by it. And there we can see our bookmark. What we might want to do is actually add some text on it. And we can do this pretty easily by creating a span whose class is FA layers dash text. It's going to tell it that we want to lay text on our icon. And let's go ahead and just write my initials. If we look at this now, we can see we have the bookmark and we have the text way too big. But because it's an FA layers text, we can use the data FA transform and it'll transform the text as well. Now, what's important to note here is that this isn't arbitrary HTML. It is actually text. So if you try to bold it here or whatever, you're going to want to style it in the span, but not put anything but text inside the span. Otherwise, it just won't work. In fact, if we did something like add a, let's say, strong. To try to bold it, you'll see immediately that it's taking that as an entire set of text. It's not applying or validating that as a way to do HTML. There's ways to do all of that if you want to, but that's outside of the scope of what Font Awesome is trying to do. So let's put a transform here and let's say shrink 10. Probably is there. Oh, look, there's our SDW. It's not all that friendly because it's, again, white. So let's again treat it like an icon and let's say FA inverse. Now we can see the STW in there. Let's actually shrink it a little more, let's say by 12 and up by, let's say two. Two is gonna tell us, gonna move it up to you instead of what we had done before, which was down 10. So now we can see we have a nice little label with my initials on it and I could do what I want there. And so this is allowing you to mix text and icons to form your own sort of cognitive pieces as well. The last example in here that I'll show you that has to do with this is let's start with an icon like Facebook. Sorry, it's brands. I always forget to change it to brands. Now we have the Facebook brand. It's nice and fine, but of course black, that doesn't really work. So let's go ahead and use a style. Again, I don't really suggest actually using inline styles. You'll probably want to actually create your own classes to add on here to do this sort of thing. But for simplification, I'll just say blue. In fact, the real blue isn't quite right. I'm not going to go look up the, the real blue, but let's go ahead and make it just a little lighter. Let's see about there. That looks good. And that looks sort of like the real Facebook icon. But what I'd like to do is be able to show it with a notification. And it actually has that idea here. What I can do is I can create another span, but this time the class is going to be FA Layers Counter. It's a special type of layer as well, just like the text was. In this case, I'm going to tell it what is realistic, which is I've got like a billion unread messages on Facebook. And we can see here it's not showing up. Of course, I know a couple of you are screaming at the screen 
but I have to put the layers here again, just to make sure that these are layered together. And now we have the Facebook with the little icon on it. And we can play around to make it look a little better. Let's add a transform here. And there may be a current bug with Font Awesome. Putting the transform on the counter doesn't seem to do anything. So I'm gonna move the icon down a little. So let's say down three. That's a little better. That way you can see it's actually Facebook and there's your counter. You can sort of play with it there. And so we've seen a lot of usage for what you can do with Fun Awesome. Obviously, this is a very limited functionality piece, but hopefully you've seen that it's useful for more than just throwing icons on your save buttons. There's more to it than that. You could really do some interesting things with all the fonts included. Now, I've covered most of the use cases that I think are interesting. You ought to read the documentation to get a better feel for it, because there are a few other pieces of functionality that I decided not to cover. But hopefully this will give you a nice rounded sense of Font Awesome. Thanks for taking the course. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned a couple of things and uh, have also gotten a chance to take a look at where some of my new courses are going to come out of. Of course, this is a free course, so you get what your money pays for. But really, if you've gotten something out of it, please feel free to share it. You can use this link to point people at the course. Thanks again. And remember, you can look at all of my courses at courses.wilderminds.com.